Hello, hello, everyone. I hope you are all having a fantastic Thursday evening so far. Um, we authors have been stressed, tired, exhausted. What other what other words are similar to that? <laughs> all of the things as we've gone through our day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, we're authors, you know, we can come up. I have a thesaurus somewhere, you know, I could just break that open that bad boy. Um, but we are excited to come and be here with you guys tonight and talk about one of my favorite topics. I know I say that a lot, but it is one of my favorite topics, uh, creating interesting and relatable characters. This is something that, oh boy, authors get wrong. And when they get it wrong, they get it wrong bad. And I would like to see that change. I would like to see more authors having strong characters um, that actually make sense within a story, within the world, all of that good stuff. And so that is uh, what we're going to be addressing here tonight. Uh, just as a kind of a quick thing, if you have questions about writing, you can email us because we're awesome and we have one. <laughs> so you can send it to media at manuscripts.com. Or if you have questions about the community aspect and kind of what we're about, you can send the email to community at manuscripts.com. So keep that in mind. I'll, I'll pop that back up uh, later on this evening, but keep it in mind for later. Uh, we love talking with you guys. We we're getting very close to Nano. Um, I can hardly believe that we're almost there. And I've totally cheated and started already. I just finished chapter three of my short story before hopping onto this. <laughs> so it's already just gone rogue. And I'm just trying to roll with it. Just rolling with the, you know, the, the punches at the moment. <laughs> so those are those are all the fun things. Emily Vanderbilt submitted her manuscript <laughs> to the copy editors, which is super, super exciting. And Zara, have you already done that? Or you were getting close to doing that? I was trying to remember. I Today, I had my final call with my developmental editor. So I have about two weeks to submit the first draft. Oh, boy. <laughs> Everyone's making progress. Look at us. We're, we're practically adulting. <laughs> All right. So um, as usual, as we get ready to dive in here, the chat is open. So if you guys have questions at any point in time, feel free to drop them in there and we will be more than happy to address them during the Q&A time. All right. So I'm going to pull this first thing up here and let's dive in. Your characters are people. Treat them as such. I cannot emphasize this enough. Now, for all the non-writers who may stumble across this live stream at some point in the, the distant future, you may call us schizophrenic, but that's not actually the, the case. <laughs> and for all of you writers who are uh, working with unscrupulous characters, characters that just decide to do whatever it is that they want, you know what I'm talking about. They just do their thing. They're stubborn. They're insubordinate. They're you, let's face it. <laughs> That's why we love them and hate them uh, to varying degrees. So uh, I want to talk a, a minute here for, or excuse me, about how to write characters like actual people. And this is really where the authors that I have worked with, talked to, mentored, hop on the struggle bus, and then they just go round and round, is that we we tend to have this idea that characters are built in a DD format that it is name race sex height eye color hair color weapon preference <laughs> magical ability <laughs> and then that's all there is to a character that's not all that there is to a character that would be saying like that's all there is to zara or emily or myself Oof. is just oh. those things 
And I mean, it, if I'm going to be associated with anything, it's going to be the weapon preference. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> swords all the way. Um, cause I can't hit anything with my bow. So the aspect of building a character starts with the core emotions, just like with people. And one of the ways that I go about trying to build my characters is one, I usually look for some character flaw in myself and they are many. So I have lots to choose from. And then I go, okay, well, what type of character do I want to express this trait in? You know, the, uh, the, the running from responsibility. Well, that takes place in Jaden primarily. And Jaden is one of the characters in the city of snow and stars, which is my, uh, my novel, my fantasy novel. And my so, favorite character. Sorry. <laughs> I had to. <laughs> he's, he's a bean. I've been told he's a small bean and that he must be protected at all costs. And that if I do anything besides the slight me aiming that has happened <laughs> to him, that there will be consequences. So very true, very true. I'm the in, prince I'm who's running from responsibility. Yes. Yes. Sir. And that is something that I I definitely have struggled with my entire life. So I, I take that, but then it, it has to go beyond that because he has to become his own character. And so I I think about the scope of the book. And I go, okay, what do I want the character to feel over the course of this book? Now, this is the, the kind of the very nebulous thought of like, this is what I would like for them to experience in terms of like character growth, um, emotional roller coasters, what have you, over the course of the book. It will change. It will vary. That's okay. But it's that the general idea that kind of starts that foundation. And it's like, okay, once I have that idea of what are they going to feel, I then look at, okay, well, what makes up their personality? What characteristics do they have? What traits do they have? And the way that I broke it down uh, to avoid like, heroic hero is heroic or overly villainous villain re who revels in villainy uh, to avoid both of those. I created a, a worksheet for myself, essentially where I had three columns and on one side, it was the heroic traits on the other side. It was the villainous traits. And in the middle was human. Okay, guess what? We all have good and bad traits. Um, I am just as likely to help somebody as desire to stab them. So, you know, Preach. it's it, 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 it all fits into the middle. Uh, so I, I create 12 slots and essentially I take six traits from the left heroic side and six traits from the villainous side and I mash them together in the middle and that's what makes up the character. Mm -hmm. And what that does is then it gives me an idea of their personality like are they loyal are they a liar um do they just have a very very uh do they have like an intolerance to truth like what it like what is it doing this allows me to figure out some of those core emotions and i also do the same exercise with the emotions part of it so that way i kind of get the whole spectrum mm -hmm. now i haven't even gotten to what the character looks like yet I'm still trying to figure out who they are. Once I have that, then I move forward and look at the backstory. Like, okay, well, what, what, why do they have these traits now? And then I will start working on the backstory uh, to varying degrees again. And then once I have that, I can now move into my actual physical appearance. And in many cases, like if one character had like, let's say an abusive dad and his dad hit him upside the head with the bottle and he's got a scar on his forehead. Well, I wouldn't have known why he had that scar until I had written out the backstory. And then I can now incorporate that scar in a meaningful way rather than being like what, you know, teenage me would do. Give him a scar over the eye. 
Why? Because it's cool. And it makes him look badass. <laughs> Aside it from being just that reason, <laughs> now there is an actual story behind that that you can now take and leverage in a very powerful moment should you choose to do so. So, because um, we are the sum of our life experiences up to that point. The same goes for your characters, regardless of what you're doing with them in the story. So uh, keep that in mind. Now, when you're actually taking that and turning it into dialogue, prose, all that kind of stuff within the story, there's some things to take into consideration. One is the style of their voice. This is all informed by all the stuff that you've already just done. Uh, Jaden, I'll use him again, um, is very sarcastic, but charming. Um, and he tends to try to smooth talk his way out of things, which usually doesn't work, but he makes a valiant effort. Um, very, very self-centered. And so when I'm writing Jaden, that self-centeredness has to come through in the way that I'm conveying everything within that chapter. Because I write very limited, very close third-person POV. Um, it's the style that I, I grew most comfortable with. And I mainly because I sucked at omniscient. And so I was just like, yeah, it's not going to do that. Let's just get nitty gritty into like a character's head. So as you're writing a particular chapter and you're looking through, let's say one character's perspective, the pros around are in that chapter should reflect the personality of that character. Even if it's not dialogue. It's how they view things. It's how they think. It's how they are perceiving it. Um, and that can be difficult to do because it's much, much easier to do just like narrator. Like, here's the things that are happening as they go. But it lacks the connectivity uh, to that character. Um, Udar is another good example. Uh, he's one of the other main characters in my book. The guy is grumpy, grumpy, cantankerous, and um, incredibly edgy. Um, not in like the cool edgy way, but just like you look at him wrong and he'll probably punch you in the face. Um, it's what being alone, you know, in a forest for 300 years with monsters around you can do to a person. So everything that through his perspective is very cynical, very kind of bitter, uh, Trinia, who's the main character in my book, a lot for, for her, everything is new. Uh, there's a lot of traumatic backstory that informs her actions, um, how she perceives people's actions um, throughout the course of the story. But it's in the prose. It's in the way things are described. So as you guys are working through your characters and trying to really kind of flesh them out um that is some of the things that you want to take into consideration now a lot of that applies to third person first person is an entirely different beast and for the most part first person particularly present tense i despise with a fiery hatred um because it's not done well the vast majority of the time because i don't when reading, I don't care about the eggs and how they tasted and that there wasn't enough salt and that you could have used salsa and you might want to go get another refill of orange juice while munching on the bacon while you're waiting for the toast. But I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> don't don't write like that. Um, for first person, you have to have a life about you. It can't feel just like you're monotone. And that, if I were to pinpoint my issue with present tense, is that it tends to come across very monotone. So your character has to have life. The dialogue, the prose, the descriptions, everything should change to, you know, just a little bit 
depending on the character that you're looking through. Someone's going to say pop. Another person's going to say soda. Someone might say fizzy water. Someone say magical elixir. I don't care what it is that they say, but you have to create differences in order to make something feel vibrant. You can only do that if you know how to write your character and who your character is. Uh, now, I'm going to touch on... Uh, let's see. I'll, I'll do... Um, I'll start with a Marvel one. I love Captain America, love Thor, um, and ah, shoot, who was the other guy? Iron Man. I liked I liked all the heroes. The ones that I found the most interesting, though, were Loki and Thanos. Those, to me, were two of the best done villains um, because Loki had emotional stake and Thanos. Thanos was a sympathetic villain. Now, I've had a lot of pushback from people and be like, Thanos was a murderer. Yes, he was. <laughs> he was not a good guy. <laughs> like, let's, let's, let's clear that up right now. He wasn't a good guy. What they did, and this is why I loved Thanos' character, is that they made it so that way he was firm in his convictions. And it was something that to a degree, everyone respected about Thanos mm -hmm. as a character going about it in all of the wrong ways. Mass genocide, never a good idea, ever. In the history of ever, <laughs> this isn't a good idea. But when they wrote him in such a way that his conviction was just like, I'm right. This is the only way to save the universe is to wipe out half of the universe. And then that moment with Gamora where she's like, what did it cost you? And he says everything. It's like, you don't feel bad for the guy because, again, he's a jerk. But you see that it wasn't an emotionless choice. I mean, he had to sacrifice Gamora at the, you know, in order to achieve it. And if you haven't seen... Infinity War by now, sorry for the spoiler. <laughs> it's been out for a while. You'll live. So those are some things to take into consideration. Like when you're writing your characters is they don't necessarily have to be overly villainous villains who revel in villainy. Um, and they shouldn't be just like super heroic heroes. There should be a nice mix. Even the heroes have a backstory. Even the heroes can have something that challenges them. Uh, and we don't even have enough time to go into why to avoid the um, uh, the Mary Sue Skywalker Ray debacle. That was the... If you like... Yeah, I, I won't even get into that one. Uh, but don't do that. Just don't, just don't pull a Ray. Just don't do it. D don't don't make all powerful characters like that. I don't care what gender they are. Don't do it. No one likes it. If you that's a the fastest way to tick off a reader base is if you do the um the all powerful character that either A doesn't need help, so it's kind of like why am I why am I reading this? B there are no stakes, no real stakes. Uh, so there's no interest level there. Just don't do it. Avoid it. Um, if you want to some good examples of well-written characters, George R.R. R. Martin is a, a really good example. His plots within plots and the character intrigue and all that stuff, the, the depth of his characters that sometimes bring into question, you know, who's bad, who's good, it, Who's the who's the actual hero? Sometimes you can't really tell. Mm -hmm. Those are that's a good example. Um, Tolkien, Tolkien with the Lord of the Rings. Uh, if if you want some next level characters that you're just like, I don't know if they're good or not. Read the Cimmerillion. <laughs> read all about the Cimmerils, 
and all the shenanigans that happen there. And you're like, oh, Feanor, he's such a, oh, genocide. Okay. Again, genocide, not the answer. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want examples for really strong, very well-written characters, I would suggest reading some of those types of characters. I would not read YA for strong, <laughs> strong character building <laughs> for the most part. Um, for the most so that, part. For the most part, not across the board. You have two YA authors part. with you here, sir. <laughs> hey, YA author. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, <clears throat> so with the exception of us, I'm just kidding. There's, I'm sure there's at least one other person out there, probably Kyra. <laughs> um, <laughs> so just kind of keep that in mind. If you're looking for characters that you, and you're not really sure kind of where you fit and how you want to do it, um, read get ideas for what types of characters are out there, how other authors do it. Take note of the good and the bad so you can avoid the bad or use it appropriately when needed, but especially focusing on how do I tell good character stories? Um, so we're going to transition now to Emily and she's going to be talking about women in fiction and old tropes that never, uh, that don't work. And I'm particularly excited about this one because uh, strong woman who is strong, Captain Marvel. Um, that trope is really, really annoying to me simply because mm -hmm. it doesn't do justice to female characters. And I hate that. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm, I'm Emily, woman. <laughs> share with us the wisdom of not doing the dumb. Yeah. Um, so, I in order to kind of have this con purposefully breaking or leaning into female stereotypes and tropes, um, it's kind of important that we first understand what those tropes are and where they come from. And so if we look to history, I'm sorry, I'm a historian as well, so I got to throw that in there. We're going to go back to the past. Um, if we look to history, there's these two extremes that we generally see in the way that women were viewed. One on the one end is that women were kind of placed on a pedestal. They were expected to be pure and perfect. This kind of like angel of the household mentality where there's something to be saved and preserved and protected. Um, kind of on the opposite end of that is if anyone fell short of those expectations or whatever that looked like did not really measure up in whatever way, um, they were disgraced and shamed and outcast. And so it's important to remember as we kind of have this conversation that men were traditionally the ones recording history and writing literature, um, at least literature that was like published and widely known. The way that women were represented in history and literature kind of came from a, men, a man's perspective um, because they were kind of leaning into one of these two tropes or views of women when they represented them in history and in literature. And so as far as like the tropes themselves go, there are a ton of them, um, not just for female characters, but for male characters as well. Um, but at least in the case for women characters, all of the tropes can kind of be traced back to one of these two extremes. To kind of give you an example, on the one end of the spectrum would be kind of like the damsel in distress. So that is obviously kind of tracing back to the view of women being like, again, on a pedestal, something to be saved. On the other kind of end of the spectrum is like the witch or the old hag. Um, again, that's kind of tracing back to if you don't fit for whatever reason, you're, you're outcast, you're disgraced. Um, over the years, we have seen like a shift in the way women are portrayed in literature and history. Um, that's kind of been just a byproduct of women gaining more freedom and access and like the ability to pursue the things they want to and write the stories themselves. Um, but even with that shift, which is a positive shift, um, sometimes in order to, to break or counter things, we almost kind of develop a third extreme 
Um, I would say with women authors specifically as they're trying to combat that, but I've seen it with men, male authors as well. Um, but you kind of lean into that character that Steven was just talking about um, where they're, they're super rough and tough and like completely independent, don't need help, don't really have any flaws. Um, really there's nothing else to them other than kind of their, their tough exterior and personality. Um, this is obviously a problem. Flaws are what make characters female or not feel human. And that's kind of the entire goal of writing a character is for not for them not to feel like a flat character on a page, but like a rounded out full human being. Um, that's that's not to say that like tropes should not be used. Um, people like them, we go back to them, we enjoy reading them, but you have to be intentional about using them and you have to lean into them or break them for the sake of the story. And so <laughs> some people might argue with me on this next point, but I would argue that most characters are tropes to some degree nowadays. Um, that's actually kind of what we crave right now is these different tropes. But with the caveat layered with different characteristics and flaws and other things kind of like built on top of it to make the character more interesting. Um, the trope is part of the character. It is not the entire character, which is where you kind of have that distinction. You want it to just be a part of who they are, not that entire character, because then they're not interesting. Um, just to kind of like give you an example, if you read Crimson Time, I'm sure if you looked into it and you thought through my characters, you would probably be able to trace each one back to kind of the trope that I started with. Um, they are there. I used them. Most authors do. Um, one of the interesting things that like I had to personally navigate on top of like how far I wanted to lean into and break certain tropes was the fact that all of my characters are descended from historical figures. Um, so I had to kind of figure out how much I wanted to lean into or break kind of the expectations of who their ancestor was. So to give you kind of an example of that, um, not, a, not a female character, but a really clear example. So I'm gonna use it. Um, um, I have a character, he is a descendant of Vincent Van Gogh. So it would be really easy for me to just say, okay, he's a descendant of Van Gogh. He's a painter, he's an artist, something along those lines. Um, but to kind of flesh out the character a little bit more and not make it such a direct tie to his ancestor, um, Colden cannot actually paint or draw or anything to save his life. But to still kind of keep him in the realm of art, he does love art, he's interested in it, and he works for an art dealer. So. But we're still kind of an artist and like ha he has that connection to art, um, but it's kind of like spun on its head a little bit counter to what you would expect it to be. Um, one of the things that has really helped me as I've been going about like developing my characters um, is keeping in mind that like me as the author, I should know more about my characters than I put on the page, than my readers will end up knowing. Um, it might not necessarily seem initially important to know anything, to know a, a character's music preference, um, to know what their go-to article of clothing is, to know what their dream vacation, just different things like that. It might not initially seem like those things are important. But if you as the author sit down ahead of time before you launch into the story itself and you can answer those different questions about your character, having those on some sort of character bio written down somewhere and then in the back of your head as you're writing is going to ultimately help that character come to life a lot clearer and a lot more naturally. Um, if you have kind of those things in mind, rather than if you're just kind of like flying off the cuff. 
um, you, you will have things that kind of develop as you're writing a character that you may not necessarily expect or may not have planned. Um, and that's okay. Like that happens, lean into that and kind of like see where the story goes with that. Um, but again, you, you want to have some sort of foundation before you launch into the story itself. Yeah, I like that. I think especially with um, having the backgrounds that that you should know more about your character than, you know, the people will probably ever know about the character. <laughs> and the fun part is, is you can always keep adding, you know, like for some, yeah. of, some of the characters that I have, like, I really didn't have any backstory while writing them other outside of the initial, like, uh, you know, Brandwin, for instance, you know, she's an assassin, she's a slaver. And that was kind of about it. She was very good at what she does. She's very successful, wealthy, all that kind of stuff. And I didn't really have anything beyond that. There, there wasn't a need for it at the time. And then, she shows up for book two and it's like, here's my entire backstory. You're going to need that for later. I'm like, no, Branwyn. No, <laughs> you don't get a POV in this book. She's like, right. So there's the backstory. You're going to need that for later. <laughs> so yeah, I, I love that. Yeah. Um, one of the, the other things is, why do you, th just as a, as a quick follow-up, because you know, again, the 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 poorly done female characters, whether it's written by a female author or a male author, and some of the ones that the males have done, guys, you really can do better. <laughs> like it's not hard. Like I've been complimented on how I handle some of the topics from a woman's perspective in my book. And it didn't take rocket science. It just was just thinking of just like, gee, what would a human being do in this situation? Hmm. Exactly. That, that's you know? it. You, you hit the nail <laughs> on the head. They think instead yeah. of thinking, what would a human do with a soul? Because we're more alike than not. You know what I mean? They think I'm a man. What does it, what would a woman do instead of I'm a human being? She's a human being. She has a soul. She has a heart. What is she feeling? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the yeah. I think even a, a fourth trope that I've seen crop up um, more and more within, within, I'd say probably the YA novels, especially um, mm -hmm. is the, just the psycho ex-girlfriend type trope mm -hmm. where it's, that, or it's just like, again, overly villainous villainous who revels in villainy <laughs> like uh emily like yeah. from your perspective what can someone do to avoid doing so poorly with that type of character <laughs> yeah and then i want to like preface this by saying to like female writers are just as guilty of falling into male tropes oh, to yes. like spin this conversation on its head too. Um, but yeah, I mean, in general, if, if you're trying to write a race or a gender or something opposite to what you embody, whatever that is, um, one of the things that I found super helpful is A, talking to those types of people. There, there were several lines or actions that I wrote for, um, that I wrote for some of my male characters that I had to literally go to different men in my life and go just like, would you do this? Does this make sense? Like for a man to react this way or to say this or whatever that looks like. Um, so don't be afraid to like ask those questions. Um, that's the only way that you're going to learn because that's not the experience that you embody. Um, other than that, reading widely and watching those interactions on TV or movies for those different sorts of characters has helped me a lot as well. Um, 
sometimes it helps to see it rather than just read it on a page. Um, or if you can get a, a book and movie or book and TV combo that does both where you can see how they do it on the page and then kind of see how that was translated to the screen um, will help you kind of have that visual as well to make sure that you're being a little bit more natural in whatever you're trying, who you are. Yeah, I, I, I think that especially just like going and having a genuine conversation with somebody and and just asking them, be like, hey, is this how you would react? I did that like yeah. because the uh, chapter 23 of my book deals with some very, very hard things. And the experience that Trini goes through, I physically can't experience. So I went and I talked to, uh, to a female about it. I'm like, hey, look, am I representing this accurately? And she was like, yes, from everything that you've shown me, yes, that would be that would be accurate. I'm like, great. That is horrible. I'm a horrible person. <laughs> but I'm but I wanted to make sure that I'm accurately representing across the board. Yeah. And again, not rocket science. It's not even big brain stuff. It is literally just having a moment to go, gee, what would someone do in this situation who's yeah. not me? <laughs> yeah, uh, I love that. Uh, Zara, uh, relationship dynamic between characters and how to avoid toxicity. I'm super curious about this because um, like, like in my book, I actually had somebody point out that the relationship aspect between um, a couple of the characters was actually toxic. Now, granted, that was intentional on my part um, to showcase a very, very specific type of toxicity. Hmm. Um, but I'm very curious to see your take on this, you know, on a broader perspective. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, you kind of touched upon that when you said it was intentional to show toxicity, but we'll get to that. So um, yes, very happy to be here. Um, so Emily and SD did a great job explaining how to build your characters. I will try and tackle what to do once you have them outlined and you need them to interact like human beings instead of aliens who imitate human interactions. <laughs> so um, I am going to tell you a bedtime story, um, more of a brothers grim type of bedtime story the kind that haunts your dreams because this one is real and it does haunt our dreams <laughs> all of our dreams as writers um so once upon a time there was a young man called gerard way a young artistically inclined chap who went on to become a household name the front man of my chemical romance See, Gerard had always been a music enthusiast, but nothing ever too serious. He was into drawing and even secured an internship at Cartoon Network, housed by the World Trade Center. And one day on his way to work, the buildings collapsed right in front of him. He fell into an existential crisis and decided to jump head on into this, his, his passion for music. YOLO, basically. And um, well, he became so famous with his band, so meta, so inspiring, that he caught the eye of none other than Stephanie Myers, who modeled the entire broody, melodramatic character of Edward Cullen after him. Except, you know, she left out all the cool things and turned him into a sparkling vampire. <laughs> so the pinnacle of toxicity that spurred all these subsequent romance literature and turned romance, one of the most adored and popular genres, into a joke. So thanks, Gerard. Thanks for nothing, my dude. Um, <laughs> just kidding. I adore him <laughs> and my chemical romance. I'm a huge fan. Um, so that brings us to the behind the scenes of writing, right? It is one of the most perplexing, contradictory thing in life because art in many forms, whether it's written word, spoken word, films, media, is often treated as unimportant, shallow, unless you're of course making millions off of it. But 
it dictates culture, it dictates societal views on pretty much everything from what to eat and drink to who you should marry. So when you already enter the game as a writer, technically at a disadvantage, because it's been hammered into you that whether you have to, what you have to say will not have any impact, it kind of makes sense that writers are not being more cautious about what they put out into the world. And the reason Twilight Saga is a gift that keeps on giving and annoys me so much is because it, first of all, completely ruined any and all respect society had towards teenage consumption, which used to be good. And two, it opened up a huge can of worms. There are arguments being made that Twilight did not start this trend of toxic portrayals of relationships in media and books for that matter. But I disagree. If you think about it and pick up any romance book or put on any Netflix romance movie, it all boils down to beauty and the beast narrative. Doesn't matter who's the beauty, who's the beast. It's about one person being broken and the other, other person, usually a woman or someone with a more feminine side is supposed to be the human band-aid for the other person's psychological issues. So let's break it down. Why Beauty and the Beast didn't start it. <laughs> um, Beauty and the Beast, the original French version, was written by a woman, Gabrielle Suzanne Barbeau de Villeneuve. Um, the 19th Disney animation that we are all used to and most likely to know is largely based on that. And when people talk about Twilight, they often refer to this piece of fiction as a point of reference. Bell got Stockholm Syndrome, shouldn't fall in love, right? No. <laughs> Go watch the 90s animation or read Gabrielle's book. The Prince, the Beast, is for all intents and purposes, a terrible person. But Bell doesn't let him off the hook just because he has had bad things happen to him. That doesn't justify his behavior. Um, the conversations they have, she isn't into him. She's terrified, a very appropriate response when someone practically kidnaps you. Um, but whether he starts to change because he starts falling in love or out of necessity to make Belle like him, he does start to change. He gives her a library, stops snapping at her. When she runs from the castle, he lets her go, risks his life to go save her from the wolves, etc., etc. Now, compare that to the 2016 live version of Beauty and the Beast, a movie that came out after the Twilight era. He doesn't give her a library because he wants to do something nice for her. He gives it to her because he despises her taste in books. There you go. Here are some books that she should be reading to better yourself, you peasant girl. <laughs> but what rubbed me the wrong way the most and that moment I knew they dropped the ball was when the Beast and Belle were dining together. In the original version, Belle is horrified when she sees the Beast's table manners. And what does he do? He picks up a spoon and tries to level up to meet her standard. He tries. But in the movie, what does Emma Watson's bell do? She's the one who picks up the bowl of soup and eats like an animal. Sure, I will stoop down to your level, <laughs> you jerk. And now we have a relationship that's unbalanced and sending the wrong message into the world. So how do we avoid it? Um, do we stop exploring the conversation or pushing the boundaries? No. Life is messy. We want to read about messy relationships because it removes the barrier between the author and the reader. It's relatable. Plus, we want to root for the characters. It makes us feel like if they win, maybe we can win too. It's a, but it's actually very simple. Universally applicable technique, whether you're building a romantic dynamic between the characters, platonic dynamic, parental dynamic, it can be applied across the board. If you're writing about messy, toxic, unhealthy, you have to acknowledge that it's messy, toxic, and unhealthy. Acknowledge, because there's a difference between self-awareness and acknowledgement. If your heroine falls in love with her professor, it's not enough that she says, oh, this is so wrong, and that they proceed to consume that relationship as if anything and everything the professor says or does doesn't automatically comes with an or else suffix because there's power imbalance. He's in the position of power over her, whether whatever directive he says that is meant to come off as sexy 
comes off as creepy, but it's dressed up as romantic. It's fluffed up. It's presented as romantic. If you want to stop perpetuating toxicity in writing, you cannot dress serious, I'm stressing this, serious narrative of power imbalance as kinky and sexy and whatnot. If you're wondering, by the way, which book I'm talking about, Gabriel's Inferno by Sylvain Reynard, gem of a book, needed exorcism after reading that one. I was like, I'm writing a book with a romantic subplot. Let me go and read some romance. <laughs> Boy, was that a mistake. So... <laughs> Um, if you, if like, if you want to come at me with Romeo and Juliet argument, which also has been used as a parallel, as a parallel very clumsily and all the nose in the Twilight Saga, go read Soul of the Age by Jonathan Bate. Shakespeare's intent was to bring attention to the foolishness of youth and how dumb 14 year olds were already back in the 16th century. Just because the public interpreted it the wrong way and twisted it as pinnacle of romance, wanting to die for someone on Tuesday evening when you met them Sunday evening, that's not Shakespeare's fault. Not, not, not that willingness to commit suicide for anyone, even if you've known them for ages, would ever be okay. So the takeaway is don't tell your audience they're eating oranges when they're clearly eating apples. Acknowledge, acknowledge, acknowledge. Punish your, punish your characters if they're acting dumb. Don't let them get away with stupidity. Consider the consequences their choices might have. And most importantly, have empathy for them. They are your babies, your creations. Treat them as such, as, as Dee said, um, with a healthy, healthy dose of tough love. Um, your work has impact. Even if it's just one person who reads your book, you have the power to shape opinions with your art. Spark the conversation. No one knew who Stephanie Myers was until everyone knew who she was. Keep that, keep that in mind and create with good faith. Yeah, such great advice with the uh, with the relationships and and trying to avoid some of that uh, toxicity. You know, one of the one of the the toxic tropes that I have seen um, comes in the form of immortal meets mortal girl and it's totally just like oh my gosh she's just the best and it's like Brosif like you gonna outlive her by a long time mm. like why you know the and that again it all plays off of the the twilight trope um, of immortal vampire finds boringly ordinary emo girl and it's just like you're the best i sparkle <laughs> and it's just like yeah no no, no. <laughs> it's just it's not it's not good um, um i i the, completely agree with you um the thing is with twilight it's what would you call that fantasy fantasy right so paranormal. it still has that paranormal, like whatever. Fantasy. So it still, yes. Yeah, so it still has that, um, that that kind of argument behind it. Oh, it's just you know, uh, let it be what it is. It's just a fantasy. Vampires don't exist. Correct. But look at the mm -hmm. art. The art that spurred from it. Three hundred and sixty-five days. A very real movie about kidnapping and Stockholm syndrome. That's real life. That there's no fantasy element to it. Or Fifty Shades of Grey, another gem <laughs> about like I I heard someone say on the internet that if Christian Grey wasn't a millionaire and good looking, this would have been an episode of Criminal Minds. <laughs> and it's such yes. a good point. It's such a good point. So um, my problem yeah. with Twilight is I I can't I can't just be like we we cannot ignore the message that it's sending. Um, like technically Edward doesn't treat Bella horrendously like Christian Grey does with Anastasia, but the dynamic between them, first of all, they fall in love for no reason at all. <laughs> She's in love with him after, after five minutes of me. That's just, you can be certainly infatuated with someone, you know what I mean? But the level of toxic attachment that this girl has for this man for no reason at all, except except for the fact that he's a vampire, like this unworldly creature, 
there's nothing special about him, although there could be, is just poorly written. Like if you look at it, Edward is a, Edward can read minds. That's a super interesting thing, but it's never developed. Like the implications that, that it has, you know, it just, it's like, <laughs> what? It, it goes over everyone's head in the book. There's literally nothing to be done about it when it's such an interesting trade, you know, to be explored, but nothing. So, um, yes, the when the immortal one meets the mortal one, it's still fantasy and people tend to just gloss over, it. you know, it's fantasy. Let it be what it is. No, look at what it's doing to, 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 to the Roman genre. It's an absolute catastrophe. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And that's actually one of the, the interesting aspects that I, I kind of inadvertently created with my book. And that was what the person was kind of touching on um, that when they mentioned in their review of the book that, you know, there was kind of this toxic relationship. Trini is obviously coming from abuse. Um, she's 16 in the start of this book. Uh, Jaden is 19 and they're, they're, you know, unhealthily attached very, very much so. And the, the thing that I am, showcasing in that is that there is actually a thing called trauma bonding and that doesn't mean that there's actually anything there outside of the traumatic bonds that you share with that person but it can feel like there is and that's one of the uh components she's like i don't think that it's good that this 19 year old boy is you know like maybe having feelings for a 16 year old girl and I was like, Pedo. that's the point. A little bit <laughs> I'm like, but slide, here's slide. the thing. Her race can live upwards of like 500 years. So that dynamic actually changes in the long run, just from a story mm -hmm. perspective and from a lifespan perspective. Suddenly she's the cougar. And then that's, and so it's like now, and this is actually something uh, Jaden wrestles with in book two is, this realization of like, she's going to outlive me by like centuries. Like, mm -hmm. this isn't healthy. This isn't good. Like, like it, this isn't an, an okay thing. And it causes a lot of that. And they're really, what it boils down to is he realizes that they are trauma bonded versus having actual like loving romantic feelings yeah. for each other does he love her yes but it's more so as a friend because he knows what she's mm. gone through and he's and he's there mm. and so it's like you have to be intentional and, and be very careful like when you're writing about toxic relationships and um you know the the things that we've been talking about because you know, whether it's um portraying male characters correctly portraying female characters correctly, portraying toxic relationships correctly, or any number of things that really the overall advice can, uh, advice can apply to. You just have to be purposeful. You have to be intentional. Don't write trash. Don't write garbage. Don't purposefully set out to do that. And the only way that you end up doing that is if you don't think through the consequences that come with character decisions it's the only way you get there and you know because like i've played out like the whole thing for twilight in terms of the consequences it ain't pretty <laughs> like it's super gross and gives me the heebie-jeebies so like like just take for five seconds just be like you know what it sounded like a good idea at 5 a.m but now <laughs> that it's 3 p.m <laughs> and I'm halfway through my day. Mm, man, yeah, probably just going to avoid that <laughs> altogether. What is really baffling to me, as Emily pointed out, that it's mainly women who write this. And when I look at it, I'm like, do y'all really want to be kidnapped? <laughs> because I'm telling you, if he kidnaps you, he ain't going to look like anything that you're watching. <laughs> That's my first main point. And it's it's just um, 
recently I read a book by an author who I really, really respect. Therefore, I am not going to say their name. And there was a female character stooping down to the level of an angry, angry man being his Band-Aid. And I'm like, that was cool 25 years ago. <laughs> right now, here's the business card of my therapist go fix yourself <laughs> and <laughs> I, ain't gonna, I ain't gonna fix you it's not my responsibility it's not my job once you're okay we can come together and love each other you know what i mean like finding the the balance between in writing and in life ultimately between i support you but i can't fix you no one can do that you, only you can do that and perpetuating this trope this trend in literature especially where the where a toxic man severely with, with severe anger issues can be saved by the love of a woman guess what he can't look at john mulaney <laughs> he had a wonderful wife bless his heart and bless her they divorced and i'm sure she did all she could to support him and love him, it just wasn't enough because no one could have done that for him. He had to make like make that decision to try and better himself. It's just, it ain't gonna work. <laughs> it just ain't. And it angers me when I read about it in liter literature or anywhere else. It's not my responsibility as a woman, as a human being to fix you. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> Yeah, and the I think the the trope uh, again like tropes are great. We use them all the time. They should not be you should not be afraid of tropes. It comes back to you should be purposeful with tropes. You know that you should be intentional with tropes. Mm -hmm. Like Emily said, figure out how how can you break the trope. Like that is one of the uh, one of the fun things that I enjoy doing when writing is like. I can use this trope because a reader will catch it, but how do I break it to turn it into something that is not necessarily new, but different than they might've expected within the context of the story. Like that is what uh, I highly recommend that you guys do. Um, gonna uh, pull up here uh, the question of the day and we only have a couple minutes left and uh, we haven't dropped any questions. So I, I must say the, uh, the, the one comment that, that came through, um, that was probably my favorite from manuscripts was don't mess with Zara. You know, she will beat you with books. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I loved that. Very non-violently. Um, yeah. Non, non-violently. <laughs> verbally, very, very verbally. <laughs> yes. Yes. The sheer amount of book knowledge will verbally bludgeon you, um, <laughs> to a pulp. Uh, <laughs> So the question of the day, and we'll we'll wrap up on this note here, is you know when it comes to characters, what is your main struggle? Um, I think for me, the main struggle with writing a character is really trying to get their backstory, because typically, like while I mentioned everything at the very beginning of you know, like laying all that stuff out most of it's done in my head because i've been doing this for so long um that i don't take time to just sit down and write out the entire backstory because usually something about it changes and so i just when the backstory happens it happens as i'm writing and building out the world typically like my short stories uh i have a you know a, a new cast of characters for the short stories I have no idea what their backgrounds are and it will develop over the course as I'm writing it. And then I'll add that stuff into round two, you know, that's just, but that's, that tends to be where my struggle is overall. I think for me, um, the Crimson Time series is largely Adelaide's story. Um, so as I've been writing Crimson Time, Fractured Past, and whatever the next one will be, um, I'm so focused on her story 
because it is her story that um, sometimes my other characters and like their narratives fall to the wayside a little bit. Um, so usually on revisions is when I have to go back and like find the right places to kind of weave in different elements of like who they are, where they came from and they've incorporated into the larger narrative. Awesome. Sarah, how about for you? Oh, for me, I would say writing a satisfying arc. Um, I can write a pretty good character, but um, personally, I like to write characters who learn and who grow because I am of the fundamental belief that, yes, people actually can change to a certain degree. Certainly not their core personality traits, but the, some of their beliefs can kind of shift. Um, but <laughs> I ran into a problem <laughs> in my current, in the book that I'm currently writing. Um, the main character, Lenny Alejandro, is kind of a selfish jerk. Um, not a bad person, just really self-centered. And his arc is suppo was supposed to be, he learns how to care about other people. He learns that the world is not black and white. People can have their own agendas and still be of good heart. But <laughs> I've been told by several people now that even if he, he's so unlikable, the people are really enjoying him and are really, really, really looking forward and to what's going to happen to him. And just he caught their eyes a, as a character, even though he's very unlikable, which I heard is really hard to do. <laughs> I don't know why I did it. Because he was supposed to be unlikable from the beginning and kind of go through his arc. So I would say writing a satisfying arc, if you have in mind that you're, you want your character to grow and to learn, is something that I'm really struggling with right now. <laughs> yeah, that it, that is. That is a super difficult aspect when it comes to character creation. You know, like... Everybody at the end of book one for me is just like, what did you do? And I'm like, it gets worse. <laughs> like, like it just gets worse. I was like, but I promise you by the third one, you'll you'll probably be back to liking me and not despising me as much. <laughs> like, but you know, you can only hope that the character arc actually lands with your reader audience. Mm. You know, you can plan it all out, but you know, sometimes again like when you lose the the intentionality behind it sometimes that's when everything just spirals and then it's just like ah dang it <laughs> yeah exactly yeah so like you know do i do i do the the fan service and not let him grow or you know mm -hmm. it's the, it's that question of people are enjoying him and they are hooked on him as he is so it, you know, but it's, yeah, it's, it's great. It's what's interesting about our job, isn't it? So. Yeah, that is for sure. All right, guys, thank you so much for everybody who, you know, has been watching and everyone who is going to be following up, you know, behind us. Uh, we are trying to give you guys as much value as we possibly can from our experiences as authors trying to help you write better so that way you know you have a here's the thing is that you can get your book published the first part is you actually have to sit down and write the, the thing you have yeah. to do the thing which is surprisingly <laughs> difficult for uh, <laughs> yep. even for us oh. <laughs> second book is by far harder than the first one was which was a whole trip for me it and is <laughs> Second book is way, way harder. Yes. But we have each other. That's the power yes. of community, power of publishing. Yes. A absolutely. And so if you guys, again, uh, hearkening back to earlier, if you guys have questions about writing that you would like us to answer, um, down in the show notes are the emails. So writing questions goes to media at manuscripts.com. If you have questions about the manuscript community, you can hit up the community at manuscripts.com email address. We look forward to talking with you guys. Um, coming up, 
we have uh, just a few more uh, streams in October left. And we'll be talking about, you know, plotting. We'll be talking about world building, which is my ultimate favorite. Like I have favorites, but then there's my ultimate favorite. And then we'll be talking about just before Nano, how to bring it all together and implement your writing plan. And by then we are going to have some worksheets and some really fun goodies for you guys to be able to go into Nano with. We're all very excited for that. And you'll start seeing the Nano streams coming up here, uh, start being scheduled here pretty soon. So guys, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. And we look forward to seeing you on Monday for our next Preptober stream. Everyone have a wonderful rest of your evening.